Show me where I can rest. I am tired and scattered. I have given myself all away and I don't know how to be okay with stopping. It's as if I've been spinning plates, a strange party trick, a circus act that looks impressive but serves no one. And I'm wondering about plates. Why has their momentum caught me up? What if they are not meant for spinning at all? Why can't I bring them to a table big enough for us all? Keep them with feasting, share them around. Why can't I sit at a banqueting table and invite everyone? And let the plates be plates and use them well. I am built to last. I need to be refueled. today, whether you're watching at home in one of the other locations, whether you're catching up on this in weeks to come, you are so welcome and it's really good to be speaking to you today. I am Dr. Kate Middleton, not that one. You know how Instagram like matches what, what you're interested in? You know that thing? Everyone have that happen? Like mine is always trying to tempt me to buy new trainers. Well, mine has picked up on the Kate Middleton thing and I was flicking through the other day and, and it started like suggesting feeds that I might want to be interested in and they're all Kate Middleton feeds which is really really messing with my mind and I was flicking through the other day and 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 the one the reel it was suggesting was inside the world of Kate Middleton and I was really confused just for just for a mad second I was like I do not remember that happening to me and then I realized that that is actually not me anyway I am Dr. Kate Middleton. I am a psychologist like Elspeth. I love a church where I am not the first psychologist to be on the platform. This doesn't happen to me all the time, but that's great. I am one of the directors of the Mind and Soul Foundation. We are a national organization passionate about mental and emotional well-being. I'm also a church leader. And, And the reason that I love to talk about the mind and the brain is because mental health isn't just about illness. You know, so often the message that we get is one that basically says, just do everything you can, hopefully, and to, you'll stay well. Am I ill yet? No, I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay. The message is, this is what you do when you're ill, but hopefully just stay the right side of the line as long as you can. And then suddenly, oh my goodness, you're ill, and, and this is the problem. Here's how we support you. But actually, mental well-being is about living well. The the clues in the name. And you know, sometimes that feels easy. You're having a great time. It's a good season in life. Things are simple. You have no responsibilities. You haven't had children yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Some of you are like, what? You're too young for that. But trust me. But sometimes life sends storms. Tough times, challenging times. Moments when the whole world seems to have gone crazy. We've been through a couple of years like that, haven't we? Kind of slightly unusual. I really hope it's unusual when we hit the pandemic. But you know, life storms come. They may be about choices we've made, decisions that have gone the wrong way. But sometimes it's just seasons that we hit. Or the world around us has thrown something and we have to walk through it. Us or our friends, the people we support. Some of life's best times are actually really challenging. Following God's call on your life can be really challenging. It can take you into seasons where everything changes. And you know, in this season, as as a country, as a world... We've been through so much that's been tough. Pandemic, war, financial and economic challenge. Now this political instability. It's like even the people in charge really don't know what they're doing. You know, my my son is is 10. I've got a a son who's 10. My daughter's 17. She's at college uh, just down the road from here. You know, my son was watching Boris Johnson's resignation speech Uh, yesterday um, on YouTube and he was like mum this guy is such a clown (laughs) I'm like interesting what do you think of his politics anyway it's a weird world where even the people leading don't really know or don't seem to be people that we can rely on 
So what do you do when you've headed into a storm, when suddenly everything feels like it's spinning, when life feels relentless? How do you refuel when you're all too aware that you're running on empty? But you can't step out of the game because it's your life. What do you do when, when actually just the, the day-to-day challenge of keeping your own head above water feels hard enough, but you've got other people who rely on you, or a job that you need to do, or responsibilities that you need to meet? So today I want to talk to you about some wisdom. I love to combine wisdom from psychology and medicine. I started out as a medic. And, um, but also with the ancient wisdom from the Bible. Because this book is full of stories about people just like you and me. And I know you're thinking like, no, 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 they are, they are like in a different category to me. But no, they were normal people like you and me who encountered God and it changed their lives. And I want to look this morning at a moment in the life of Old Testament hero Elijah. I know Elspeth mentioned him right at the end of her talk last week. But this story is full of wisdom that connects with how we're feeling right now. Now, I'm not going to just read the whole story because it's quite long. So when you get home or later, or if you want to press pause, if you're watching on a video, feel free and have a read. You can catch up in 1 Kings 18 and 19. Those are the two chapters. But what happens is, this is a moment when Elijah is at the peak of his ministry. So in 1 Kings 18, he pulls off this amazing mountaintop victory. And it's him, one guy, versus a bunch of prophets from another religion called Baal. And there's loads of them, and they're like whooping and shouting. And it's very cool. Elijah ends up calling fire down from heaven. My son looks at this page in his comic book Bible. He's like, Mom, this is pretty cool. Why don't you do this sort of stuff? I'm like, yeah, it's a pretty cool moment. He wins the encounter. It comes off well. God triumphs. This is a success story in Elijah's life. He should be feeling like a superhero. But the thing is, Elijah isn't a superhero. None of us are. He's just human, just like us. And he's tired. This has been a full-on couple of days. And the thing is, is that we talk about stress so much, but it's not just about distress. Stress is anything that places demand on your mind or on your body where you have to act and react to stuff that's going on in your world. Sometimes the busiest times in life are also the best times when we get married or start something new or put ourselves through a challenge. But these things take a toll. They can be tough on our minds. And we can see this in Elijah's story because at the start of chapter 19, something unexpected happens. This guy who has just been on the mountain facing up to all these hundreds of whooping, baying people without even batting an eyelid, he is completely, totally and utterly floored by a letter. It's the Old Testament equivalent of those emails that you get. You know the ones you read last thing at night before you go to bed and you know you shouldn't do it, but you just do and that's when someone has sent you that email and it's your own fault because you shouldn't have read them last thing before you go to sleep. I do it, we all do it. So you don't get any sleep, you spend the whole night just stewing over it. Well, this is what happens to him. He gets this threatening message from Jezebel and he freaks out. This guy flees, he runs to the desert, he ends up sitting on his own and he's saying to God, I've had enough, over, game over, I want out. I want to talk to you today about overwhelm and what happens in those moments when our mind has just had enough. And it's something that many of us will have experienced in this last season. You know, challenging with all the change of pandemic, lockdowns, being at home, oh my goodness, homeschooling. Yeah, many of us with the juggle and the stress and just the craziness of that season will have hit overwhelm at some time. It can hit any of us out of the blue, but it can seriously threaten your emotional well-being. 
And that's the challenge of well-being, is not just in the calm times, but it is how do we get through the storm times? Not just muddling on through and somehow managing to survive, but the interesting question is, can we, can we even thrive in those tough times? What does that look like? And you can imagine your stress level as a bit like the, the water in a pool. If I was stood here in a pool of water right now, hopefully most of life, the baseline's like ankle level. And you know, the water's lapping around your feet. It's quite nice. It's nice and cooling. The odd little wave, which is just those little challenges of life, that's not a big deal. But we all have moments when that water level has risen and risen and risen and risen and risen. Maybe that's just a really rubbish day. You know, some days just feel like they're out to get you. Do you have days like that? It all starts fine and then one thing after another after another and by lunchtime you're like, (laughs) there's steam coming out of your ears. The water level's risen. Sometimes it's a longer term season. You know, sometimes I, I'm at that age of life where I've still got relatively young kids. I've got elderly parent who needs looking after and depends on us. I've got a quite a demanding job. I'm doing some studying as well at the moment. Sometimes my life feels like one of those logic problems where you've got like a, a wolf and a chicken and a boat. And you, you, you know that you're going to find a way to do it somehow, but you don't right now, right now know how it's going to work. And you know what? Everybody's mind has limits, We're not superheroes. We're not superhuman. When that water level gets to a certain point, you become all too uncomfortably aware that you are getting near to those limits. You know, when the water's up around your neck, you start to feel uncomfortably close to going under. One more thing could push you over an edge. You start to feel that sense of slight panic rising. Those little things that when the water level was down low didn't bother you at all. But when you're here, it feels like the end of the world. Like the other day after a really bad day and I was just like frantically trying to juggle stuff. I had stuff I had to get to in the evening. I'd had a busy, frantic day. I'm trying to cook dinner. I open the freezer and somebody has opened the frozen peas, put them back in and not sealed the bag. Are are they actually trying to push me over an emotional edge? So with cosmic force, the peas propel themselves out of the freezer. I am not kidding you. I am still finding peas around my kitchen. Now, you know, it's all very funny now, but on that day, I I just just had a brief moment. I thought, I'm just going to sit on the floor and just cry. Because this is just, right now, this is, I can't do this. The water level was already high enough. Little things become big things. You know, when you hit that mode, your brain actually goes into a kind of emergency way of functioning, and it's designed to do two things. Firstly, it's designed to drop demand, because it's like that thing on your computer or on your phone when it's like warning you it hasn't got much battery left. The bandwidth is really low now. It's like, seriously, you've not got much resources. So it it just drops to like basic functions. And your thinking, analysing, problem-solving bit of your brain gets turned right down. It's designed to make life feel simpler. You make quicker choices. So it's, it's a sort of helpful thing in a way. The world starts to feel very binary suddenly, quite simple. Things are either one thing or another. They're either good or they're bad. You've either succeeded or you've failed. Someone is either for you or they're against you. So it feels quite simple, right? Trouble is, your brain is biased towards the negative because it's just careful like that. So on, in the worst moments, you can feel right then like everything is bad. You are failing at everything. And everybody is out to get you, even the freezer and the frozen peas. It's like a personal attack. So your ability to think clearly drops. The second thing is that your brain needs to bail. It needs you to get out of whatever is causing this massive overload And so it it triggers that almost suffocating sense of of slight panic that can grow and grow and become really quite strong, like a mist suddenly over your brain. And, And your brain is like, do something. Whatever you do, do something. Get out of this situation. But of course, your thinking brain is turned right down, so you can't think of a thing you can do. It feels impossible. 
It feels overwhelming. And that's designed to get you, if you need to, to flee, to just to get out, to leave, so that sense of panic. And we can see that's exactly what happens to Elijah. In that moment, he's not thinking clearly. He's flooded with panic. And he runs away. So notice something from this story. In those moments, it feels really real because your brain is kind of messing with you to try and get you to to change your circumstances. But things are almost always not as bad as they feel. When you have those moments and it just feels like total disaster and like Elijah, you're like, I cannot do this. It's just too much and you want to just sit on the floor like me and just sob for a bit. Remember, it almost definitely isn't as bad as it feels. You know, when Elijah eventually does talk to God later in chapter 19, he says this to him. He says, the Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put your prophets to death. I am the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. Do you know what? That wasn't true. If you look back... 1 Kings 18.4, there were about 100 other prophets hiding in caves. He had people he could have reached out to. He could have made connections with. He didn't have to do it alone. But when you're overwhelmed, it feels worse than it is, and it pushes you into isolation because your brain is exhausted. Even talking to other people feels like it's too much. Your rational thinking mind isn't very good at problem solving when you're in that emergency zone so you don't do the things that actually would probably help. Listen, let's call this. These moments are risky for us. Elijah is an amazing, powerful man of God with great authority, but he ends up in a place where he basically says to God, take my life. He's, He's suicidal. It's just, it's too much. Sometimes when your brain gets exhausted, it can't think of any other way out. We need to recognize our humanity. We have limits. If life is pushing you beyond those and you're struggling with levels of emotion that regularly push you into that zone, you need to get some support. And and burnout is what happens when that level of exhaustion just pushes you into that zone and you hit those moments where you can't do it anymore. And in those moments... The very real risk is that our narrative about mental health and well-being, all we've ever heard about it, is about illness. So we think, oh my goodness, this is it. I thought I was okay, but all this time I've just been faking it. I'm actually completely like falling apart person. I am never going to be well again. This is the best I can now hope for. And, And that makes it even worse because it adds one of two things, or possibly both. Fear. Fear says, why am I feeling like this? This is awful. I can't bear it. Will I ever be able to feel better again? And the second thing is guilt. And guilt is so nasty. Guilt says, if I was better, I wouldn't have messed this up like this. If I was a better mom, if I was a better leader, if I was a better doctor or nurse or teacher or friend or whatever it is, then maybe, maybe I wouldn't have done this this way. Everybody else can manage. What's wrong with me? Guilt eats us up. So hear me, if you are struggling right now or at any moments when this hits, it's just a sign you're human, which is a good thing. Let's remind ourselves of that. In a season of our world where almost every film you will go and watch is about being superhuman, Let's remember that actually being just normal human is okay. And Elijah's exhaustion comes from good stuff, important stuff, ministry stuff he's called to. So often the only solution we hear offered to stress is where you just need to do less. You're like, great, which shall I drop, my children or my elderly mother? (laughs) I don't think my boss would like it if I dropped that either. It's not very helpful advice. And what about ministry life? You know, as people of faith, we're passionate about what God's called us to, aren't we? This room will be filled with visions, dreams, ideas, stuff that we know God is calling us, light into darkness, better life, better world dreams. They are really good things. 
we sang in that first song, didn't we, about all my passion. But we have to be careful because we're still humans. We still have limits. Sometimes our passion as people of God pushes us over them, if we're honest. There's a verse in Romans. This is Paul writing in the New Testament. And Paul was a guy whose entire life had been changed by his experience of God. And he writes in Romans 12 this kind of chapter. It's a letter that he's writing to a bunch of people back in Rome. And it's his kind of, it's his life advice for how to live and what he's learned so far. And this is just one verse. It's a great chapter. Go away, read it. But this is just one verse. He says this. This is from the NIV translation because he's writing in Greek. So we're reading a translation of what he writes. There's various different translations of the precise words that he uses. So the NIV says this. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Now, mm, zeal, fervor are not really words that I use a lot in everyday speech. Anyone else? I've tried it with my children. Show some zeal. It doesn't, it doesn't go down well. So this is the NLT translation. It says, never be lazy. I quite like that. Quite like never be lazy. Work hard, serve the Lord enthusiastically. This is definitely speaking my language. I feel like I spend a lot of my life as a mum, church leader, various other roles, trying to get enthusiasm out of people for things like English homework. <laughs> Putting chairs out before services. Anyone else yet? So I like this, yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely not being lazy. I'm working hard. I'm serving the Lord enthusiastically. And then I look up the message and it says, don't burn out. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I was so busy working hard and serving the Lord enthusiastically, but now I'm not supposed to burn out. And actually, I'm a bit flustered. How do I do that? It says, keep yourself fueled in a flame. And what this verse does is it contrasts two Greek words. The word for passion, which is this Greek word, zeo, that's about what drives you, that inner fire that means you do what you do. We're supposed to keep that fuel that, fan it into flame, Paul says in another of his letters. But then there's this word, ochneros, and that describes what happens when the flame goes out. We lose our energy, and that can be laziness, but in the context, I would suggest that a better translation is that it is burnout. We started the race, you know, like it was a sprint, and it turned out to be a marathon, the pandemic started out like a marathon and then turned out to be like a triathlon, wasn't it? You think you're done and then you've done like the running and I know this is the wrong order or you triathlon people, but you've done the running, you think you're finished, then someone gives you a bike, you're like, are you kidding me? And then you finish cycling and now there's like a swimsuit. What? And then, I mean, goodness knows what we're in now. I think it's like the sack race or something. But anyway, it just keeps coming. And our challenge with our energy, therefore, is about sustaining it. Sometimes we don't know how long a difficult season is going to go. So how do you sustain it? Three things quickly as we finish. Number one, watch out for overwhelm. Call out overwhelm. See it. Recognize it. And when you've watched out for it and you've called it out, try not to freak out. It probably isn't as bad as it feels I want to ask some of you today, do you need to recognize how overwhelmed you are? And do that in a space where we're saying, it's okay, that's not a scary thing, we've all been there. But it's, it's good to say it because you need some help, some support. Number two, do you need to recognize that you have needs? You know, Elijah is pretty provocative coming to God and saying he's had it and he wants to die. But God doesn't respond straight away, he just feeds him. And make sure he has a rest. And then does it again. Because Elijah's in that overwhelm zone. There's no point trying to have a conversation with him. He just needs to eat and rest and refuel himself. Do some of us need to take some time just to look after our own physical needs? Some of you are exhausted because you're caring for so many other people. Maybe the best thing you could do this week for them is something that's for you. A bit of time away, a bit of rest. Think about your physical needs. And then number three is this message, don't go it alone. Poor Elijah, you know, fleeing to the desert, pushed into isolation when he could have been with other people. Overwhelm pushes us into that space, but it's a risky place to be isolated. God sends him an angel to look after him. I wonder who are the angels in your life? 
Some of us need to practice saying yes when people offer us help. Or just reaching out. I'm feeling really rubbish today. I actually don't know how I'm going to get through this week and, you know, get everything done that needs to be done. Elijah doesn't recover on his own. So think, who are your angels? And maybe God's calling you to be an angel to someone else. If that's you, remember, you don't have to become a therapist or say something really clever or like pray one of those prayers that transform anything. Just bring lunch. Look after the kids so someone can get a rest. Just support their practical needs. And then finally, it's about connecting with God. Because the amazing truth about this life and this world that sometimes just feels crazy, like it's pushing us way over an edge. Like in the pandemic, I had so many times of just thinking, God, I I actually just don't know how I'm going to do this. Like, what is going to happen? Where's this going to go? How am I, what do I say to my kids? How do I support them through this? How do I create a way that they can live and still thrive and flourish in a world that feels so messed up? We need to connect with God. But that's not easy when you're in that overwhelmed space. You know, Elijah isn't ready at first. It's hard to connect with God when your brain is, is in that zone. It takes him a long journey till he's ready. And then when he does meet with God, there's a wind and an earthquake and a fire, but God isn't in any of that. When our brains are exhausted and we're over our limit, we need to meet God in the way that he comes to Elijah, in the quiet, in the peace, in the calm, in the still small voice that whispers to him. You know, there's this great verse that's in Philippians 4, which you'll have heard, that talks about how when we take our requests and share with God the tough stuff, a peace that's beyond human understanding can rest on our hearts and our minds. That's what we need when our ability to rationalize has dropped, when our brains are so fried that we can't think clearly. That's what I want to pray for today. So I'm going to take a moment to pray and then I'm going to hand back to Becky here or in your locations, wherever you are, to the teams there. If you're watching at home, just take a moment of pause right now. And I do pray for that sense of peace beyond human understanding. Lord God, we recognize in this room that none of us are superheroes, that we have limits. Some of us recognize that we're near them. Life has been tough. So we reach out in this moment to something bigger and better and beyond ourselves to you, Lord God, who can overcome anything. You can re-energize us. You can refuel us. You can give us what we need to keep running this race and bring the people we love with us. So just ask that peace to rest through the power of the Holy Spirit in this room and wherever people are watching. In Jesus' name. If you enjoyed this video today, why don't you click subscribe and click on that notification bell to get a notification the next time we upload a video. And if you're new or you've been coming to the C3 Church for a little while now, why don't you find out what your next step might be in the journey of faith? Click on the next step link in the description below to find out what your next step in your journey might be.